Let's start the topic on the rheological behavior of the rock under stress. And to study this, there are two approaches. One is to bring the concept of tensor. Another is not to bring tensor and look with our high school knowledge. So I start with the easy uh, approach. And we start with this that the applied stress can be proportional to strain for certain solids. If the stress is not too high, so that the material does not break into pieces, but due to application of stress, the material stretches, extends its length. For example, there can be a spring and that spring can be pulled with some stress. The spring will extend its length so that the spring can be called to be strained. And in that situation, this relationship might hold true. Just to recollect what is stress, it is equal to force per unit area and strain I have already defined different units. Let's take one of those units over here as epsilon. So I can write epsilon say elongation or extension parameter, which is the change in length per unit original length or even multiplied by 100 as percentage elongation or extension. So such is the unit over here. Now from this we can say stress is equal to E multiplied by epsilon. Those solids which follow this relationship are called can be called elastic solid or the hook solid and here the proportionality constant E can be called as the Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity. Now this is true for a certain amount of stress. If the stress is too high and the uh, spring snaps actually, then this relationship may not be holding true. This relation, the Hooke's law is not applicable for all the solids, but for certain solids approximately, this can be found to be true in the laboratory. Now this relationship stress is equal to the Young's modulus multiplied by strain can be compared with the relation y equal to mx. In that case, sigma is comparable with y. E is comparable with M and epsilon can be comparable with X. So now if we plot it graphically, as we know Y is plotted in this direction, X in that direction. So instead of Y, I can put here sigma and along the X axis, I can plot the strain, then a linear relationship can be found for certain rocks and solids. The tan of this angle theta can be called as E, which was the proportionality constant, the Young's modulus. Now there is a statement we find in the books and let's understand it. understand it. E is a measure of rock strength. What does this mean? We are going to see eventually that higher the E value for the rock or for any solid, stronger is the rock and vice versa. What is the opposite statement? Lower is the E value, then the rock is weaker. So what does it mean and how do we prove it? Take for example the stress plotted along the y axis and the strain plotted along the x axis. This blue line represents the behavior of solid 1 or rock 1 and this yellow line of the material 2. Now for material 1 and 2 imagine I am applying a stress sigma 1 on both material 1 and 2 in different experiments. So in case of material 1 when I extend this white line over here it touches the curve and I get down perpendicular to the strain axis, I get the epsilon 1 value of magnitude of strain. What does this mean? When sigma 1 amount of stress is applied, the body will undergo epsilon 1 amount of strain. And when I apply the same amount of stress on the body 2, then I can extend this line over here and drop a normal and I can see epsilon 2 is the amount of strain. Since in my diagram E1, the Young's modulus for line 1 is more than that of the line 2 or the solid 1 and 2. In that case, we can find epsilon 2 is more than epsilon 1 can be seen graphically. So what does it mean? The material 1 has a higher strength, material 2 has a lower strength and with sigma 1 amount of stress being applied, material 2 deforms more easily, more amount of strain has been produced. So therefore, 
this satisfies or this proves the statement E is a measure of the rock strength and higher the E stronger the rock and vice versa. Now this thing can be proved in a different way. Again here I am plotting stress along the y axis and strain along the x axis and I take two material 1 and 2 of different Young's modulus. Material 1 has a Young's modulus E1 which is higher than that of material 2 and that is why these lines are oriented in this manner. Now imagine epsilon star amount of strain has been produced. To produce epsilon star amount of strain for the material 2 sigma 2 amount of stress is required and to produce epsilon star amount of strain I can move here perpendicularly and then again move perpendicular to the sigma axis sigma 1 amount of stress is required. So what I understand is that to produce the same amount of strain material 1 has to be applied more stress and material 2 has to be applied less amount of stress. So that is what I am writing sigma 1 is more than sigma 2. So what do we understand? The material which is having higher Young's modulus is stronger and more difficult to deform. So that justifies this statement through these two explanations. They are easy explanations but I thought of clarifying now let us look at another problem of Young's modulus. Suppose material 3 and material 4 we brought in the laboratory and we found the different stress and the strain values. Let us take material 3 for 0 applied stress naturally the strain produced is 0 and for so many magnitudes of stress whatever be the units so many units so many numbers of strain have been produced. Strain is unitless and I repeat stress has some unit which I am not mentioning here. Now look at material 4 similar to material 3 laboratory in the laboratory the experiments were performed and suppose these are the values like for 0 stress 0 strain is produced so the 0 0 batches with that and then for stress amount equal to 3.01 strain of 1.49 was produced then for a stress of 4.77 unit strain of 2.4 was produced. Now if the question is raised which material is stronger is material 3 stronger than 4 looking at the data set sometimes we are able to solve such as in this case. What is the way to solve? We recall the relation stress is equal to Young's modulus multiplied by strain and we can see both for the material 3 and 4 linear relationship has been maintained. For example, if I write here stress is equal to we can see here this relationship will hold true. you can see stress is equal to 3 multiplied by the strain amount almost the almost like 3 is the approximate amount and what about the material 4 it maintains a linear relationship if we plot in a graph we will find a best fit straight line will come with a degree of correlation high amount. Now here we can write stress is equal to 2 multiplied by epsilon. If I multiply this by 2 I nearly get this amount if I multiply this by 2 nearly the stress amount will be found. So now what it means for material 3, 3 is the, 3 is the Young's modulus and for material 4 2 is the 2 unit is the Young's modulus. Since 3 is more than 2 so therefore material 3 is stronger than material 4. Now in this stress versus strain plot suppose the two lines are there which line represents material 3 and which line represents material 4. Since this line is having a greater slope so this can represent the material 3 and this line has a lower slope so it has it can represent material 4. So in this way just looking at the data set and if there is a linear relationship we can make an estimate what is the Young's modulus magnitude and from there we can say which material is stronger. So material 3 is stronger more difficult to deform or material 4 is weaker and is easier to deform. Now we were talking about the unit of strain some time back stress has a unit we can understand force per unit area so it can be in CGS unit it can be dyne per centimeter square. So this one is unitless and this has a unit say in CGS dyne per centimeter square. So what we understand is that E will have a same unit as that of stress. So the E unit can be in CGS dyne per centimeter square. Now let us look at the different kinds of Young's modulus in solids or in materials or in rocks. 
So, one can be called as a static Young's modulus. How it is obtained? It is obtained from the laboratory stress strain experiments on the drill cores. The drill cores look like cylindrical objects when the rocks are drilled and then they are picked up, their cylindrical cores are picked up. These cores can be taken in the laboratory, stress can be applied, strain can be measured and then apply the linear relationship between stress and strain and find out the Young's modulus. The second approach is known as the dynamic Young's modulus. This is obtained from the acoustic data and this dynamic Young's modulus is then converted to the static Young's modulus and I will request the viewers to find out how this is being done in detail. Now in the static Young's modulus we can have three methods to calculate. The first one is known as the tangent Young's modulus, the second one is called the average Young's modulus and the third one is known as the second Young's modulus. We start with the first one tangent Young's modulus. It is measured at a stress level which is some fixed percentage of the ultimate strength. I will demonstrate what it means and it is usually at a stress level equal to 50 percent of the ultimate uniaxial compressive strength. Now what does it mean? Fixed percentage of the ultimate strength. Imagine this is a stress axis and this is the strain axis and this material has got an ultimate strength is equal to sigma 1. Now a certain percentage, a fixed percentage of sigma 1 will be considered. So that will be sigma 1 multiplied by x by multiplying with x which is a fraction we will get a certain percentage of the sigma 1 and that sigma 1 let us say this is your sigma 2. So then plot sigma 2 over here. Now our calculation of the tangent Young's modulus will be with respect to this sigma 2 magnitude. But usually this is at a stress level 50 percent of the ultimate uniaxial compressive strength. 50 percent means what? x is equal to 0 0.5. If this is being considered then we can come back to the tangent Young's modulus calculation. What about the average Young's modulus calculation? It is the average slope of the nearly straight line part of the axial stress strain curve. Now here is a relationship between stress and strain of some material which is curving and then a linear relationship and then again shows a curvy linear relation. Now within this curve I can find out this orange line which is nearly the straight line portion. Within that portion recollect the relationship stress is equal to E into epsilon as if that is true over this particular region. So the stress magnitude divided by the strain magnitude, stress magnitude divided by the strain magnitude will give us the E value. Where is it? This is the stress magnitude and this is the strain magnitude. This length if I divide I will be getting the Young's modulus. For that material this is known as the average Young's modulus. And then the third type known as the second Young's modulus. It is measured from zero stress. That means we start from stress equal to zero. That means no applied stress to some fixed percentage of the ultimate strength. Let us say the ultimate strength of this material is sigma 3 then as I said above sigma 3 multiplied by a fraction x will be equal to sigma 4 which is a fixed percentage of an ultimate strength and the second Young's modulus will be measured from sigma equal to 0 up to sigma 4. Within that range we will be trying to find out. So how it will go? Imagine this is the stress and this is the strain and we have found this is sigma 4 magnitude and this is sigma 0, sigma 0 equal to 0 magnitude. So within this range only the second Young's modulus will be calculated. If it is a linear relationship within this range then find out the slope of the curve. So I have said that the dynamic Young's modulus is calculated from the acoustic data set. 
where it will be done it will be done where the actual rocks are not available and suppose the actual rocks are available then in the laboratory we can also find out the static young's modulus so there are several empirical relationship between the static young's modulus and the dynamic young's modulus but generally speaking this relation is true that the dynamic young's modulus is more than the static young's modulus and it has been seen for the soft rocks sediment such as shale that the dynamic young's modulus is much much bigger than the static young's modulus and how to find out the dynamic young's modulus just to repeat when the rock samples are not available we go for this ed the dynamic young's modulus calculation and we take care of the elastic compressional and the shear wave velocities now let's have a look on what factors the young's modulus depends for the rock solids or the materials so one of the factor is that with increasing confining pressure the young's modulus increases and several empirical relations can be established es static young's modulus in gigapascal is equal to b2 sigma 3 square plus b1 sigma 3 plus b0 this is a quadratic relationship where sigma 3 is the confining stress in megapascal stat es is the static young's modulus note this is in gigapascal one in gigapascal another is megapascal b0 b1 and b2 these three are the lithology dependent parameters so for different rock types we can fit best possible values of b0 b1 and b2 now to look into some other types of empirical relations the young's modulus has been found out tentatively or empirically in case of the porous rock material imagine that there is a rock that has got a porous material with a porosity of 5 in that case es the young's modulus of the porous rock with porosity 5 is given by e0 what is e0 it is a young's modulus i did not write completely young's modulus of the matrix material multiplied by 1 minus a into phi and then this to the power n here a and n are the constants and usually it has been seen that a is equal to 1 now if a is equal to 1 what does that mean it will mean here that es is equal to e0 multiplied by 1 minus phi to the power n because a is taken as 1 in that case e0 multiplied by 1 minus and i can write the formula of porosity what is that pore volume divided by the rock volume and then to the power n so i can write e0 now here rock volume minus pore volume will be equal to the matrix volume so this is matrix volume divided by the rock volume and to the power n so es is equal to this under certain situations when a is equal to 1 now we can also recall the athes law phi z porosity at a depth z is equal to phi 0 porosity at a depth of 0 that means on surface e is a exponential series b is called compaction constant but in some book 1 divided by b is called a compaction compaction constant z is the depth now if i take this relationship and please bring the camera over here this relationship if this two equation number 2 and equation number 3 are taken together i can write es which is a young's modulus of the porous rock with porosity phi at a depth z es z will be equal to e0 z here 0 and z are both the subscripts what is the meaning of e0 z it means the young's modulus of the matrix at depth z that is equal to 1 minus az instead of a i am writing az multiplied by phi z instead of phi i am writing phi z and then to the power n in this case z is the subscript it's not multiplied by z now here i can write e0 z and then 1 minus az and then this phi z this i can this expression i can substitute over here so this can be the tentative relationship or the empirical relationship empirical relationships are those which are established in the laboratory based on several experiments and best fit curves or best fit lines are used for that these are not physical laws for example newton's law can be established can be proved so those are laws whereas these relationships too many in engineering geology uh, they are the empirical relationships found in the laboratory but not yet established through physics so two things i want to explain here i have referred to the word matrix and i have also 
discussed about what empirical relationship between the Young's modulus and porosity. Let us take the first issue, matrix. As I have discussed previously in some other video that here the word matrix is not having same meaning as that of the sedimentary rocks. Here in this engineering geological or in the stress strain relationship whenever we are referring to the matrix of the rock it means the solid portion of the rock. So, which can include the grain, the matrix of sedimentary sense, the cementing material. This was one and the second issue is empirical relationship between the E and phi which I wrote down. There are several other empirical relationships also in the literature. So, I mean to say what I wrote is not the only possibility. Now, let us look at the materials which do not behave in an elastic fashion. What does that mean? If it is a perfectly elastic material then stress is proportional to strain, but in the theory of inelasticity this relationship does not hold true for certain materials or solids and in geology for certain kinds of rocks. So, here we cannot draw a linear relationship throughout for the material behavior for stress and strain if the material is inelastic. We can say that the inelastic body has one distinct elastic and one inelastic regions within the sigma epsilon space. This is the sigma epsilon space. Here we can have a straight line segment and then possibly a curved line segment. Now, what is the best relationship to explain this inelastic behavior? It is like this sigma x is equal to 1 minus alpha multiplied by s y plus alpha multiplied by e multiplied by epsilon x. Let us try to understand. Here sigma x is the applied stress along the x direction that is why x is the subscript and epsilon x is the strain produced along the x direction because of that. So, x is in the subscript. S y is the yield strength of the material. What is that? It is the stress required so that the plastic deformation starts within the body. Let us look at what is the meaning of plastic deformation. Suppose this is a strain and this is a stress axis and for some elastic body I keep on increasing the stress from 0 and then the strain continuously increases in a linear fashion. But a time comes when even for a constant amount of stress the body keeps on straining continuously. This constant amount of stress for which the body keeps on straining indefinitely or for a long time at least this can be called as the, uh, the yield strength. So, where is the yield strength in the diagram? If I draw a dotted line over here, this value sigma 1 here is the yield strength. So, here which is represented as capital S and then Y as subscript. What is E? E is the modulus of elasticity and alpha is known as the strain hardening factor. So, now here keep this equation in your mind inelastic body's behavior, it has an elastic component and an inelastic component hidden within it. And naturally, if such a graph is being plotted here, need not be a throughout a straight line behavior. Now, here I will take this and start with an example, what if alpha is equal to 0? Alpha varies from 0 to 1. If alpha is equal to 0, I can put is alpha is 0. So, this is S y and this becomes 0. So, sigma x becomes equal to S y that is the inelastic behavior because when the material extends indefinitely due to a constant stress and when alpha is equal to 0 here if it is sorry when alpha is equal to 1 if it is 1 then 1 minus 1 0. So, this entire term becomes 0 what remains here is alpha becomes 1. So, sigma x is equal to E multiplied by epsilon x and then this is our very familiar equation for the elastic behavior. So, I hope it is understood that hidden within this are there is a an inelastic component and also an elastic component and they have been added as a continuous function through this equation. Now, from this relationship you can find out alpha algebraically and this is the relationship alpha equal to and rest of the terms where the applied stress is given, the yield strength is being shown, the Young's modulus is there, the strain along the x axis is given and again s y this term comes here. Now, one interesting thing can be observed as alpha increases from 0 to 1, where is alpha equal to 0? The material is inelastic and when the material is equal to 1, 
it is elastic. So, what we can say is that, that its inelastic component keeps on falling and its elastic component keeps dominating in the material property. And when we take alpha equal to 1 and say we start from this and reduce the alpha value to 0, what will happen? The elastic behavior will keep reducing, the inelastic behavior will be dominating. So, depending on the different values of alpha, we can have different kind of relationship in the stress strain curve and this can be done as an exercise.